Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 803. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is May 24th, 2023. All right, welcome to another episode. We're glad you could join us. Before we get too far, please like us on Facebook and uh, YouTube. Share us with your friends, family, and foe. If you want to comment on things we said right, wrong, or have your own opinion, you go to the comment section. And if you have not subscribed yet, please subscribe. This is not the George I saw yesterday. George of yesterday, when we're trying to record, was frozen half the time because we had slow internet. Today, we have a little bit better internet between uh, Lucanto, Florida, and uh, uh, where am I? Um, DeForest, Wisconsin. Uh, DeForest, Wisconsin. Uh, Still in Wisconsin. We leave for Iowa next week. It'll be, I'll keep you as updated as we travel. Um, And so we're trying to get this show done before something else happens to our technology. And this is why you pray for Anglin Scripted. You pray for Kevin and George because, you know. If it can go wrong, it, it will go wrong. You've had a tough week at the office. I've had a tough week here trying to move mom to her uh, new apartment and get it all everything settled. Now we can just take a breather and do what we love to do. We love to do this. We look forward to sitting down in front of our webcams and saying, hey, what do you think about this? And what do you know about that? And so we're going to do that now with George. How you doing? I'm in a cranky mood, Kevin. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> oh, it's just ever since I got back from uh, Rome, it's just I feel like the fourth stooge. Every time I take a step, a rake hits me in the face. Uh, my senior warden resigned, and it, mm. one of these silly fights that only vestries have: should we buy one ply or two ply toilet paper? You know, something totally inconsequential caused people to get their backs up, and the senior mm. warden resigned. The, the woman, uh, the diocese has turned down another one of my people for ordination. And this is a wonderful woman who I feel is called by God. And and the diocese gave her, well, take this time and do this, do that, and stare at your navel. And and she said, no, the hell with that. And uh, she's moved to the diocese of southwest Florida, just across the county line. Mm-hmm. And so now I've got to replace someone who does all my a lot of my pastoral work. And just little dumb things and my daughter visited with his boyfriend <laughs> new boyfriend and i was so good because so what do you do oh i'm a fishmonger hmm. oh, yeah. oh re- really <laughs> you're a college man yeah but you know i couldn't find a job after college so i got a job at the uh, fish market down at the docks and uh, you know, last one made little foam artistic designs in the top of coffee in Seattle coffee bars. This one <laughs> wears an apron and has a knife and is where it's slicing fish guts. So that's moving up in the world. No longer a barista, but a working man with a knife. You, you come on, George. This is the right direction you're looking for. Yes, he has a job. Yeah. I didn't see any tattoos. Mm. He didn't smell like fish. Maybe they that's eat a bad. in the bath yeah. with a full mm. light. Uh, he did have a nose ring, but hey. You know, I can only ask for so much. No, it's crazy time. So, uh, quick update. We got mom moved to her new retirement center. Uh, Jill and I are officially out of here next week. Um, We spent a month, you know, uh, putting dad to rest, getting mom moved from a place she's been for 15 years to a new place. And we got all her stuff moved as well. Oh, she's got a lot of stuff, George. Is she going to do the pink tut and be buried with all her treasures? Or I don't know. She yeah, she's, she's, uh, she has lots of stuff that she's finally going to go through. So yeah, you know, yeah, she's. We'll have to see what happens, George. Uh, my brother now lives six miles from mom, and I think he's going to be more of a chauffeur than he thought. So we'll see how it all works. You know, and she's going to get rid of her old uh, her old Madison phone books from the nineteen seventies. So we still need those. <laughs> no, but you, if you knew the stuff that she did keep, you'd be going. Uh, and it's not phone books. It's just you know odds and ends. And there's people of a particular age who she was raised by her parents who grew up in the Depression. Mm-hmm. So she knows everything has value to her. But now that she no longer needs that stuff and she's moving on in age, she has assigned a, a special person in her life who should receive that. 
So er, er, everything's not going to goodwill. It's going to Aunt Betty out in Minnesota. It's going to Uncle Ron down in Arizona. Uh, every little item is going someplace. And that's just the way mom's brain works, you know. And you, you just have to nod your head. And yeah, if, you, if this is your goal, go for it. I, I honor my mom and dad. And uh, sometimes I do crazy things. And I assure you, my children think I do crazy things, George. And, but yours, your kids think you're normal, exorcist man. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Oh, my daughter had so much fun telling her boyfriend all about what daddy was up to in Rome and everything. And this poor kid, his eyes are as big as saucers. What have I got myself into here? <laughs> you bring out the the oil, the candle, the book. Ah, you want to date my daughter? <laughs> all right, George, let's move over to some news here. And I'm looking at the Anglican.ig website which we're a sister of here at the uh, Anglican Scripted. And there's a lot of news stories out there that we should talk about. But I think the biggest one here is that the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury has called for a meeting of the primates in 2024 in Rome. Now, I don't know if you know this, but he's kind of had a rough spring already. Uh, the Church of England is in absolute disarray. Uh, with all the groups up in arms about the LLF and what the bishops are going to do and what the sin is going to do and how long it's going to take or if Justin's going to kick this can down the road. And he, in the middle of all this, says, hey, it's time we start planning the next primates meeting. Okay, <laughs> uh, sure, why not? Let's do, let's do that too. And so GAFCON and the Global South have made it very clear that they don't see a future um in the leadership of the Anglican Communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury, especially Justin Welby, in charge of it, George. Yeah, the, uh, I'm quite surprised that Justin Welby issued this invitation without doing any preparatory work. Hmm. GAFCON 4 was quite clear that they will not uh, heed any call from the Archbishop of Canterbury for a primates meeting in the Global South has echoed this sentiment. They will not come to a primates meeting called by Welby. And in fact, both groups want to reorder the uh, relationships within the Anglican Communion. And uh, the Welby-centric primates uh, meeting is out. But Welby did it anyway. So what's going on here? Well, Justin Welby, uh, when all these calls were made for uh, change, laid out his plan. He said, yes, we do need to make some changes, but here's how we'll do it. We'll send this to the Un Unity, Faith, and Order Commission of the Anglican Consultative Council, which will take three years to study the proposal and make observations. These observations will be taken to the Anglican Consultative Council, which will take three years to make recommendations. The recommendations will come to the primates and to the Lambeth Conference in eight to nine years' time. Justin Welby retires in three years' time when he hits 70, if not you know, sooner. You never mentioned Indaba. Isn't there some Indaba in here somewhere? Well, yes, we need to talk <laughs> and sit down and go ooh and ah. Ooh, ah. Um, <clears throat> so Welby is playing the long game of sort of trying to uh, by exhaust the opposition by interminable discussion without consequence, without authority, without meaning. Uh, for those uh, following the Lambeth Conference website, and they're not that many, they've just announced the third phase of the Lambeth Conference, which is Zoom meetings of the bishops to discuss issues like sustainable development, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, things that are all mimicked from the World Economic Forum in Davos. They're agenda items. Well, Justin Welby is a speaker and participant of the WEF, and they're sort of passing on that sort of worldview of uh, into the Anglican Communion. Well, the GAFCON in the Global South and the rank and file of the people in the church is saying, gee, all that stuff is nice, but tell us about Jesus. Uh, tell us about salvation. Tell us about the moral issues facing us today, about the crises we're facing of faith and order and all of these tests. And Justin Welby is trying to spin out the story until he's safely off the screen, off the stage. Will it work? We don't know. There's we been don't. no responses publicly that we've seen. This is my worry. 
Okay, we saw the, the, the big change at GAFCON where GAFCON says we're no longer going to be a, a political participant in all of this. We're going to be an evangelical participant. We're going to go in and do the work we believe in doing. The Global South has, has stepped up and said we will re-involve ourselves politically and try and fix the system uh, sans without uh, Justin Welby. Mm -hmm. Well, here's an invitation to go to a meeting where in in force if you all showed up if all of the global south showed up you would have the majority and could change the agenda or if you decide to do it haphazardly five of you show up and you don't have the agenda uh this is really this is maybe a trick that justin will playing to see if he can divide and kick this can far far down the road george mm -hmm. now people are giving advice there's uh some press releases that just were put out by Paul Eddy, Vinay Samuel, and Chris Sugden, saying this is the path the Global South and GAFCON should take, and they should work with the Archbishop of Canterbury and to achieve this and that and the other. That's good advice, but I'm sure the primates are getting advice from all quarters. There are some people who subscribe to the Kuti theory of uh, theology, where if you have anything to do with someone, you get cooties, which are uh, little bad bugs, which you catch in the playground from icky people. And so no, no contact whatsoever. And then there are those who, yeah, we're happy to talk. We're happy to go on an all expense paid trip to Rome in the first week of May, 2024, but we're not gonna take anything away from this other than a few souvenir postcards. Um, there is no, clear way forward here. Now, the Global South is having their council meeting with delegates from around the world towards the middle of May in Cairo. Could be that they issue invitations to all the primates to come to that as well, in essence, have a parallel primates meeting. Well, I don't know what that'll happen. Or they can all boycott Rome. Don't know what's going to happen. Um, the uh, I think what you have to say, it's well and truly over for Justin Welby, unless there's a catastrophic collapse of morale or third world war breaks out. And we all put aside these differences until the end of hostilities. Um, the game's over for Justin. He just is, doesn't have the uh, moral and spiritual authority to uh, pull this off. Well, and that's the... Opinion. No, and that's right, because Justin Welby has managed to lose the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. at almost all levels. Can the primates trust Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby? No. He promised to help with the Episcopal Church uh, situation and hold them accountable for three years at the uh, primates gathering uh, in, um, it wasn't London, it was in Kent, Canterbury, uh, and didn't do it. And he, he's made several promises, even within the Church of England himself. He is accused of being a hypocrite when it comes to the safeguarding issue. And there's a whole new mess within the Church of England over uh, the LLF. Justin Welby cannot be trusted inside or outside of the province of the Church of England. Well, he can be trusted in one thing. Okay. Justin Welby believes in one thing, and that's unity, 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 unity. Mm -hmm. He wants everybody to come to the party. He doesn't care if they have a good time. He just wants them to come to the party. He wants everybody to stick together, even if they don't believe in the same things. And that is something that he was saying when he was the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Bishop of Durham, when he was the uh, Dean, I think, of Liverpool. This has been a theme throughout Welby. This is a consistent point of who he is. He doesn't believe in absolutes apart from the principle of visible unity. He doesn't believe in theological unity. He doesn't believe in, and he doesn't work on the principle of theological rigor. This is why he will, he has been saying for years that if, uh, if we are not agreed, we should still be seen to be walking together. Um, which, of course, there's a biblical phrase which sort of goes to the opposite of two or you know, don't walk together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't, don't be unequally yoked. Or uh, certainly in Romans and Hebrews, uh, uh, it's talked specifically about don't find yourselves amongst unbelievers who are trying to destroy you. And in my in my opinion, 
Justin Welby and his like are slowly destroying the gospel, whether they're trying to or not. Yeah. Justin Welby really is the Archbishop of Laodicea, the lukewarm Archbishop. He's not a hot and a cold. Uh, yeah. He has his, the, there's equal ire from the left side of the auditorium as there is from the right side of the auditorium, with both sides thinking that he is not sufficiently endued with uh, moral clarity and rigor. And he tries to uh, split the differences sometimes. Now, from a tactical perspective, it makes sense in Justin Worby's worldview to call another meeting and try to have unity once again, and then have the administrative machine bulldoze any and all opposition. From a strategic point of view, this is very silly news, if you will, silly action, because what's to prevent uh, a blow up at a Rome meeting and have three quarters of the primates walk across the street to the dicastery at the Vatican, charged with dealing with anguish and say, don't talk to Justin anymore, talk to us. Yeah. We're 85% of the people on the ground. Don't bother with Justin Welby. Um, there are, there is potential, strategic potential for chaos. And I don't think any strategic potential for, uh, for Justin a good outcome other than delay. Well, if you look back at, at the history of Justin Welby and uh, a little bit with Roland's before him, this is the butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. You know, bad decisions made back then were just little itty bitty decisions have just catastrophically uh, ripped and torn the fabric of the Anglican communion. We have nothing to show for uh, the work of the Archbishop of Canterbury, the work of the AAC, or the ACC. We have nothing to show for the work of uh, Lambeth. Uh, because they've all been muted. Nobody cares anymore. Yeah, the BBC is not showing up except to film uh, because they're a state uh, uh, press that they have to film for the Lambus and stuff. It's it just nobody cares, George. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, a, that is a shame because we are talking about salvation issues here. Mm -hmm. um, is the gospel trustworthy and true or is it not? Or are, are, which way are we going to jump? Uh, well, now comes the phrase, for me and my house, we shall follow the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, maybe this is the time for that differentiation. I don't know. Well, we got a, a couple of press releases and information from the Church of England Evangelical Council. And we have agreed not to publish stuff, but we can still kind of talk about it, right, George? Is, yeah. yeah, they put they put they sent an email to members and uh, mm -hmm. to uh, supporters, and we got one. And at the very end, it says, "Please don't publish these statements on social media, or uh, or news outlets." Hint, hint, George and Kevin. Yeah, okay. Um, well, we're here to help <laughs> because we want to stay sort of in the background, but we certainly talk about the uh, strategy that the Church of England Evangelical Council is working on. They have a new leader, John Dunnett, uh, after uh, Keith Sinclair stepped aside. Um, and they basically have a three-pronged strategy, sh short, medium, and long. They are still working to overturn the results of the synod vote on same-sex marriage. They want the outrage from around the world, and the latest to add their outrage were the Kenyan church. Kenyan church said it was, quote, appalled, unquote, by the vote in general synod, and they will distance themselves from the Church of England. And the Kenyan church, even though its bishop is a member of GAFCON, its bishops are sort of split, and they all signed off on this, all those who were present at the meeting, the House of Bishops meeting. That being said, they, they want the, the Church of England Evangelical Councils hoping that they can dissuade the bishops at, from coming out with pastoral guidelines and liturgies that change the doctrine and discipline of the Church of England. Now, the bishops have been saying all along that, oh, well, gay blessings will not change the doctrine of marriage. Nobody believes that fiction, except for the bishops. Um, that the practices, practices, you know, one of the old Anglican saws is lex arunde, lex carende, the law of praying is the law of believing. Yeah, well, and if we live. have prayers for one thing, that means we believe that. And if we have prayers for the blessings of same-sex unions, and the lawyers of the Church of England can say to their blue in the faith, well, this doesn't mean physical sexual relations. It could be 
two people who happen to love each other in a chaste way, we are not necessarily saying this is sexual. Yeah, pull the other one. Um, they're hoping they'll undo that. Second, if that doesn't work, and by November, when the final reports are done, it looks like the Church of England will drink the Kool-Aid and go all gay all the time. They will stand for a separate province or separate differentiation, whatever it's called, uh, so that there is a vis visible structural differentiation between those who hold to the faith as handed down by the saints and those who hold to the faith as handed down by the House of Bishops and Justin Welby. If that doesn't work, the third prong is to help those who want to stay in the Church of England find a way to go forward. Now, they're being attacked by conservatives who are saying, well, you're already surrendering by saying you'll stay in. Well, the Church of England Evangelical Council is neither in or out. It's a membership organization. Its members are going to vote with their feet. Mm -hmm. And some of their members will not leave, and they still feel the obligation to support them in their captivity and also support those who are in their exile. But that's step three, and they're hoping that steps one and two will not need, not require that they reach step three. I don't know. We'll have to see. But for me, you know, they're saying we want another option. We want a parallel option. Uh, GAFCON and the Global South are, uh, not the Global South, GAFCON has offered some options, but they're not really interested in that. Yeah, and Gafcon's also said we're not going to be sending flying bishops. We're not going to recreate the situation we had with the Anglican Church in North America mm -hmm. of having safe bishops until we get an entity in place, because we have that entity in place, the Anglican Network in England. And leaders of the Church of England Evangelical Wing and the traditional Anglo-Catholics aren't ready to jump ship yet. They're not ready to join uh, the ANIE for various reasons. Uh, then the problem is, what do you do now? What do you do? Uh, if you're a massive church with a great deal of money and a lot of people, and you basically sort of fund your diocese, you can call your shots. But if you're a poor church and a, in a state, which is an urban blighted area or housing development, public housing, and you need money from the diocese just to keep the water on and the salaries paid, and you're faithful to the gospel. Lysis of Leicester is already cutting off money to places who have uh, expressed uh, concern over the course of the direction that ISIS has taken on the gay issue. So these guys are going to get cut off. Um, what do you do? How do you serve the people whom Christ has called you to serve who live in difficult circumstances when the national church will no, or the diocese will no longer uh, pick up their share? difficult situation what do you do yeah, it's hard i mean we see that here uh certainly uh in america between the, you know some of the remaining uh faithful episcopalians there's not a mm -hmm. lot um but there are some uh and you know what do you do do we still uh fight the good fight within the episcopal church or uh do we leave i just saw a, a press release from the Neshota house and I thought we could talk about that a little bit because they're trying to clarify amongst a, a little bit of um, uh, questions that were going on uh, on Twitter uh, the last couple of days, what they stand for, who they are as a seminary, um, and how can they serve both the Episcopal Church and the ACNA? You know, and I, you know, I, it, this, is, this is kind of the CEC type situation. Do we stay? Do we go? Who do we help? Well, just as there are woke people on the left, there are the conservative equivalent of woke people who scream bloody murder and foul if they detect any hint of heresy. So the witch finders are both on the left and the right. Recently, the Living Church put out an article highlighting that the fact that Neshota House in Wisconsin and Duke Divinity School in North Carolina both have programs for Episcopal and Anglican ordinance. And it was a bit of a puff piece, how nice this was. It, it didn't talk to current students. Uh, oh. I talked to some, some <laughs> it, older students. I think it was a little, not on purpose misleading, but it certainly didn't give uh, a, a full-scoped magazine-type story. 
Yeah, and some people reading this article came away thinking that Neshota House was a sellout. Um, Duke Divinity School is a Methodist school and is basically not on anyone's radar. And good for them that they have an Episcopal and an Anglican program, but it was Neshota House that caused all the controversy. And so on social media, there was a great deal of harsh criticism. How can they allow people with cooties to study uh, among our people? They'll poison them and this and that. Well, I, I don't agree with that mindset at all. I don't think, unless you're weak-minded, you're not going to be swayed by other people. I went to a very liberal divinity school that had very conservative professors and very conservative students. I, 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 can, I can beat that. University of Wisconsin, where critical race theory was formed. And I, I came out on Alex P. Keaton, so. <laughs> you know, unless you're predisposed to go that direction, you're not going to catch the disease mm -hmm. uh, unless you're weak-minded to begin with. Um, and you will get an excellent education at both schools. But to show the house, uh, to sort of put paid to all this nonsense that they've gone soft, put out a statement of beliefs, which essentially laid down their uh, bona fides and belief in the traditional Christian revelation and doctrine and teachings on moral, ethical, and social mm -hmm. issues. And I guess it's a shame that in this day and age, we're so quick to jump and see heresy among mm -hmm. our friends rather than uh, sort of walk with them as they try to balance these things. Neshota House needs to have people from both sides of the aisle. They get, you know, the former Bishop of Springfield is on their board of directors as the, I think the current one is, and they get seminarians from Springfield, which is an Episcopal Anglo-Catholic diocese. They get seminarians from Central Florida, and then they get them from Fort Worth and various other Anglo-Catholic actor dioceses. Um, and you'll find there's hardly any differentiation in the mindset and the thinking of these seminarians. But still, we have people who want to give purity tests. And, yeah, uh, yeah, but I, I also appreciate people who want to hold somebody's feet to the fire. I have questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to, to see the Neshota House responded pretty quickly uh, through the board of directors and the leadership, Oh, cool. It's not like, it, it's almost like they had this in backup. It's not like they just produced this overnight. You know, this is this is what we believe. Here it is. And, um, you know, we try to work with what we got. Okay, I got it. You know? Well, I just, I, I no, I'm mind reading, but I can throw it, sort of <clears throat> see that uh, Woody uh, uh, Anderson, uh, hmm? Garwood Anderson. Okay, friend, friend, of, friend of Anglican Unscripted, friend of Anglican TV, you know, great guy, yeah. I can see him reading the article in Living Church saying, ah, oh, great, any publicity is great publicity. Sure. <laughs> and liking the story that, because it talks, says nice things about Neshota House. And then people blowing up, and, he, and I can picture him going, oh, geez, you know, I don't need this. And, uh, well, here we are today. Here Always. we are. <laughs> All is well in uh, Neshota House and Trinity. And the, I could... I can't name all the great Anglican entities that teach seminarians in America. Every time I do, I get an email for the the, the five I forget. Uh, we should make a list one day of just the, the the Anglican seminaries available here in America or North America. You don't want to forget Wycliffe, and uh, you know just what's available for students out there because uh, a lot of people don't know. I get emails all the time. Where should I go to seminary? <gasps> well, if I was going to pick my favorite, it would be. Not going to do that. We don't do that here on Anglican Scripted. Let's move on to, oh, we're going to go back to the Church of England, George. Um, we talked about John Sentamu and uh, Bishop uh, Croft last week about the safeguarding, and it's just not getting any better than news we hear this week. And I thought we need to talk a little bit about that. And if we have time, we'll talk about Mike Pelavanchi as well, George. Yeah. The, uh... Could you try again? That was Siri asking got, a question. I, I got that. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the the drips keep coming in the uh, Johnson Tamu uh, Stephen Croft affair. This all started with a safeguarding complaint lodged ten plus years ago by Matthew Innocent, a Church of England priest, who, when he was a teenager, was molested by a Church of England priest, and at the time, uh, and, and and this guy was 
nothing was done about it. Stephen Croft, who at the time was Bishop of Sheffield, closed his eyes to it. And Johnson Tamu, then the Archbishop of York, closed his eyes to it. Uh, the fellow went to trial. Uh, just before he went to trial, the, the molester, he killed himself. And it just was a mess from start to finish. Well, a report was finally done that found that Sintamo had not exercised oversight over Croft and had not done his job. And Croft had not done his job and basically had let the side down and let an abuser get away with murder. Helen Ann Hartley, the Bishop of Newcastle, suspended Sintamo, who was living and working in Newcastle in retirement. The question is, what about Croft, the guy who did all this stuff? who didn't act, who didn't this. Well, the Diocese of Oxford, where Croft is now, started being sneaky. They started putting out press statements saying, well, we couldn't really act because at the time this was going on, Innocent was involved. There was a complaint against Innocent. Whoa, so oh, them. they're trying to reverse uh, engineer what really happened there, George. So they're, they're blaming the victim. They're blaming the victim. And the complaint basically came for the fact that Innocent wouldn't play ball and he complained to outside uh, authorities about the uh, rape and abuse. And because of that, just like in Southwark Diocese, uh, there was a case where a priest who, when the diocese was inactive, he complained to other parties. He was brought up on charges for basically divulging secrets. Well, Innocent was cleared of all misconduct by Croft. But this just stunk to high heaven trying to rubbish innocent to save Croft. And now there are some more uh, high level evaluations of what's going on that basically says that Croft must go. Uh, he, this is where he failed the side. This is where he let things down. And it's just, uh, it's fascinating to me that today we had the announcement that there's no Bishop of Lincoln uh, Stephen Conway, the Bishop of Ely, is being transferred to Lincoln, translated to Lincoln. Well, the old Bishop of Lincoln, Justin Welby, had sat down for lesser crimes, he suspended him for a year or so. Justin Welby suspended Justin Welby for far. Uh, Justin Welby Just suspended George should. Carey. Should. <laughs> suspended George Carey yeah. for for not exercising juris supervision over a day student at the seminary he ran in the 80s or 90s, mm -hmm. uh, Trinity College in Bristol, I think it is. And Justin Welby has taken no action against Stephen Croft, none whatsoever. And the standards uh, that Santama was held to, if applied to Welby in the John Smythe and Jonathan Fletcher cases, would see Welby set down. So why are they not acting against Croft? Well, the buzz is that if Croft goes, he's going to take Justin with him. Who knows? I don't know. Well, but there, there, there's some truth here that we're missing. You and I have uh, published letters um, from victims saying that Justin Welby won't meet with them. Mm -hmm. We have unpublished letters that we won't publish because it's a little bit too personal of victims who have accused Justin Welby of not meeting with him according to the safeguarding rules that he should. He's just as involved in this in other cases as Croft and as Sim Tavenu. It would be really interesting if the next Archbishop of Canary, the, the Bishop of London, would suspend um, Justin Welby as well. Yeah? Uh, poor Justin. Um, he's just... Everything he turns touches turns to fudge. It doesn't turn to go. <laughs> oh my! Okay, so you know, once again, uh, we'll talk about uh, Mike Pilavanchi. I never knew him before a week ago, uh, but he has more victims coming forward. Uh, he is uh, the guy, in, the founder of Soul Survivor. Uh, can you give a quick update? I don't want to spend too much time on this because if I haven't heard of him, most likely nobody here uh, around the world except the UK has heard of him, George. Well, uh, Pivolacci founded a very popular youth uh, ministry program, national, that was very prominent in evangelical circles. And he became sort of an untouchable character, akin to a Ravi Zacharias, somebody that there might have been whispers about, uh, but nobody did anything. 
And the latest stuff to come out is that we now have victims who came forward in 2004 to say that unprofessional, untoward things were happening with interns and they complained to the supervisors and nobody did anything. And the again, it's the old story that Pivolacci is too valuable in his public role to ups, to chastise him for his private misdoings. Um, that's, you know, I hate to say it, but that's the way of the world. That's the way of institutions. If a person is doing great things here, they'll sort of, well, if he's got these problems there, we won't say or do anything until he's no longer valuable to us. But that's a repeat of 1970s televangelist, 1980s televangelist, 1990s televangelist. He's bringing in too much money, and he's the, the fruits of his ministry is too good to hold this guy accountable. And, oh, what and, happens the, whole Catholic, and yeah. the Catholic Roman clergy Catholic. abuse skin. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the things I've, I, I've heard uh, was in, in uh, Rome, mind you, and I'd heard it before I went there, was that there's a lot, a lot of patience with these dioceses in the United States that are going bankrupt, Catholic dioceses, because of a massive settle, massive uh, payouts to victims of clergy abuse. Because there were a few Catholic dioceses that once they found out about the abuse, they immediately suspended the police. They called uh, the priest. They called the police. They they went and reached out to the victims and said, "How can we help you?" Yeah. And those dioceses have never been sued, and they're pro and they have no problems. It's the dioceses that prevaricated that transferred people from place to place so as to get them out of one bad situation, then started causing another, who fought and wouldn't give help, that are suffering $100 million judgments against them. So in some respects, uh, people were saying at this Catholic conference, you know, a pox in the house of that diocese because they brought it upon themselves. This is not a universal Catholic problem. This was a problem of bad Episcopal management. The problem of Mike Pivolacci is bad management. The problem of Stephen Croft and Johnson Tamo is bad management. We have the rules. They just don't follow them. Yeah. They are not held accountable, and they are not beyond reproach. Now, what was going to happen? George, let's talk uh, another follow-up story. I mean, th this is an interesting follow-up story. The worst PR disaster uh, that I can think of in the Anglican communion in the last 15 years was the EMEA blow up. Okay. Uh, some odd reporters who are on the webcams brought up a story about the EMEA back in episode 15 and all hell broke loose. Bad PR. And the EMEA t does not exist today because of how they handled a redeemable explanational situation uh they just went and tried to kill the messenger and they it blew them up i'm looking here at another story that just doesn't seem to ever work its way out and that's uh christ church cathedral in oxford and they're just trying to fix this B bad pr george and everything they do doesn't work Dominic Greaves, a former government minister, was asked to do an external review of the whole Martin Percy fiasco. Martin Percy was the former dean who was hounded out of office and the college spent six million pounds fighting him. And, and the, the Dominic Greaves paper basically says that they spent all this money to avoid scandal and what they got for their six million was scandal. And Greaves is recommending that they separate the cathedral from the college. The dean of the cathedral of Oxford is the dean of Christ Church College at Oxford. And they're saying, look, we need to, it's about time we separate these things, let the church be the church, the college be the college, so on and so forth. But the old system of uh, preferences and privilege and money it didn't work. And here's an example of Martin Percy, who was not guilty of anything other than being an outsider, being almost driven to mental breakdown by the de the dons at Christchurch. And we just need to reorganize the whole darn thing. 
Okay. <laughs> Hope that works out for them. We'll have to see. Hopefully, we don't have to report on them anymore. It's good news if you don't end up on Anglican Unscripted, George. Oh, but Rick Warren, who baptized 57,000 people, uh, has been made chaplain of a Baptist seminary over in the UK. Oh, Chancellor. Oh, Chancellor. Chan oh, why do I have chaplain? Ah, Chancellor. Sorry. Spell, spell check. Spell check. <laughs> yes, okay, that's going to be it. Rick, Rick Moore, but Spurgeon College is a Baptist uh, college in London, very famous, very venerable. Um, and Rick Warren has been made on, as the cha chancellor, which is the honorary president. The vice chancellor runs the college. And it's sort of a fitting crown to Rick Warren's career um, in the uh, ministry. I met we met him in person in Fort Worth. Do you remember sure. that, Kevin? I, I interviewed him, not in Fort Worth. I actually got to interview him at Hope in the Future. He was at the Hope in the Future conference uh, up in Pittsburgh, and then I met him and did an interview with him down in uh, Fort Worth for the launch of the ACNA. That's right. That's where we saw him twice. But yeah. uh, uh, I didn't get to interview him. You did. But uh, very nice man. He, he's one of these people in person who is like he is, if you will, in the pulpit on stage. Um, no, I'm serious. A very, no, yeah. very, very nice, uh, genuine person. Um, genuine articulate and always on message i remember mm -hmm. doing his my two interviews with him um i asked it pointed questions extremely pointed questions and he answered on message to what he was there to talk about <laughs> which is some book or something you know or or this this month's uh saddleback bible study was you know he was always on message that was the answer to every question okay this isn't going anywhere but yes, articulate, George. Saddleback is having a bit of problems. He stepped down. They've been uh, removed from the Southern Baptist uh, Convention because they now have women pastors there mm -hmm. on their staff. So, you know, these interminable fights among Baptists, that's a constant throughout history. The Baptists will always be at war with Baptists, just like Anglicans always at war with Anglicans. Apparently, yeah. but, we, I, but I wish, we wish Rick Warren well in this honor as he caps off his career in retirement. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, last uh, thing I have here, story number seven, follow up to George's visit to Rome. So you, you, you told people last week you went and attended a 10-day a exorcist conference. Um, and I'm sure with our vast audience of uh, tens of thousands, you got a little bit of feedback. Yes, I did. Um, um, most of it positive. Mm -hmm. Some people I still owe responses to. I apologize if I've not written to you uh it's been a very trying time this week um but one of the things i wanted to mention uh comes from not sort of the classroom content but the interchange interchanges between students and the faculty and with me uh, again remember uh 140 odd catholic clergy from around the world there was some german clergy there the german catholic church is very liberal institutionally liberal, it's bishops are liberal, they're pushing for gay marriage, they're pushing for women clergy, they're pushing, they're almost undis not undistinguishable from the Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. seriously, on these issues. Um, they're, they've been captured by, the, the top has been captured. And there were some Catholic priests who at a certain time got up because we were discussing performing exorcisms, you need Episcopal permission to do so. And a German priest stood up, said he was from this diocese, uh, I'll, I'll give the diocese Cologne. He was from Cologne. And the bishop there does not believe in exorcism. He believes that it's all fantasy. He believes that there are no such things as demons. He believes that evil is a concept. There is no personal devil. The devil has no personality, even though Catholic dogma teaches otherwise and this and that. And the bishop will not exor authorize exorcisms. And besides, the bishop is keen on uh, gay blessings and uh, women clergy and having lay uh, oversight of the synod. And he said, what do I do? Do I seek alternative Episcopal oversight? And this, his voice, it was so poignant for me because I had heard this at Episcopal circles 10, 15 years ago. What do I do with a bad bishop? Do I seek alternative Episcopal oversight? Do I go underground and do it anyway, find a bishop who will let me do this and I just don't tell anybody. 
And the teachers were very clear. They said, we need to take a page from Ignatius Loyola, who was loyal to the church, even if the church was corrupt and crooked. And the message was, until such time as the Pope gets rid of these bishops, you still owe them authority. Now, what and you I, do... I, I agree with that. You know, what you do in the exorcism cases, you do deliverance ministry, mm -hmm. which doesn't require a bishop's permission. Mm -hmm. And God, the, the, uh, the teacher said, is probably not going to get all chuffed about uh, you doing deliverance because the bishop has said no to exorcism. The same result will come. But to me, it was fascinating that the, the German Catholic Church is going through the same destructive pains the Church of England's going through, the Episcopal Church is going through. There are Canada, faithful Catholic Brazil. clergy. Uh -huh. There are faithful Catholic clergy in Germany, in Austria, who cannot bear what is being done to their church. And they're just, they're being told, stand fast, you know, honor the oath you took of obedience. Yeah. And I got to tell you, that's hard. That's <laughs> very hard. Well, you were uh, going to contact the Catholic uh, diocese in your local area. Any results there? Yeah, uh, they basically said buzz off St. Petersburg. They don't do exorcisms. They have an exorcist, but he doesn't do any. I mean, he hasn't been active in years and years. Okay. So I'm going to have to try the diocese of Orlando, and if not them, maybe the diocese of St. Augustine, mm -hmm. so that I can find uh, someone whom I can join their team as a prayer assistant and observe. But St. Petersburg, the di Catholic Diocese of St. Petersburg has a really terrible reputation uh, for abuse. It's one of those bad dioceses. Uh, uh, and so I'm not surprised they don't have a serious exorcism ministry there. They need one, but they don't have one. All right, George, I think we finally got this show, which took two days to, to put on film, uh, done. I hope so. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 803 of Anglican Unscripted.